Welcome back everybody to the 8th part of uh, my Blu-ray collection and uh, yeah, today we're going to be going through the HMV exclusive uh, premium collection. Now HMV is a uh, entertainment store that is widely popular in the UK and uh, yeah, uh, they recently got bought out by a Canadian company called Sunrise Records I think uh, but nonetheless they are superb. They uh, offer not just Blu-rays but you know DVDs, CDs, vinyl, like, uh, electrical equipment and all that lot but it's their uh, Blu-rays that are uh, where they excel best especially with their exclusives. And uh, yeah, the premium collection is basically a um, archive collection of Warner Brothers uh, film collect the films over the decades. And uh, yeah, a massive, massive variety. And uh, yeah, they all, they all predominantly come with art cards or posters or sometimes both. There's only a couple of exceptions where they don't come with either of them. But um, yeah, because there's so many of them that I have, I'm not going to be going through all of the art cards and posters Especially since some of them are up on my wall. So, uh, yeah, nonetheless, let's start off with the uh, first one. Now, they're all numbered on the spine, 1 through to, I think, 140 they're up to at the moment. And, uh, yeah, the first of them is this, Them, one of the best sci-fi uh, 50s films out there, quite frankly. And, uh, yeah, it's about giant killer ants. And, uh, yeah, can't really get any better than that as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, superb effects. It's really, really fun from beginning to end. has a, uh, yeah... It's only 92 minutes long, so it's in and out before you know it. And, uh, yeah, it's really, really fun. And uh, if you're a fan of these kind of B-movies from the 50s, then uh, I highly recommend it because, uh, yeah, it's definitely the best of its class. And, uh, yeah, comes in a normal case. Not sure if this comes with a DVD. No. Only a Blu-ray on this. Sometimes you do get a DVD along with the Blu-ray. But, yeah, that's the first of them. And then the uh, number two. Yes, I have one and two. Is Forbidden Planet. Now this is again another sci-fi film from the 50s, got an early appearance by Leslie Nielsen who would obviously go on to bigger things in the likes of Airplane and uh, the Naked Gun series but yeah another really rather good 50s film, not as good as them but still really really rather good and uh, yeah looks absolutely impeccable and uh, yeah also comes with a uh, second film called The Invisible Boy which is basically a uh, sequel with the robot that you see on here. A little bit uh, worse than the uh, than Forbidden Planet, but still a pretty uh, decent f follow up as well. No matter how loosely it is a follow up. Now this one is numbered four, and it is Soylent Green, starring the great Charlton Heston. It's also got a uh, later appearance by Edward G. Robinson, who was in a bunch of thirties, forties, and fifties films. But yeah, this is one of his later efforts, and yeah, it's a sci-fi dystopian future film. Where uh, but, uh, I'm not going to spoil it because uh, yeah. That would just be uh, spoiling it overall. Edward D. Robinson is in that second picture you can see there. Yeah, one of his later roles, but no, by no means one of his uh, lesser known roles. And uh, yeah, superb sci-fi uh, dystopian future film. And uh, yeah, highly recommend it. Again, only 97 minutes, so it's in and out before you know it. I imagine a lot of these films aren't going to cater to a lot of people that are used to more modern films, but they certainly cater to me. And then we've got number five, and the superb All the President's Men, starring the great Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman, as uh, two newspaper reporters dealing with the Watergate scandal. And, uh, yeah, great film. A little bit on the long side, so if you're not into long films, then this won't be your uh, kind of film, nearly two hours, 20 minutes long. But, yeah, riveting film, and, uh, yeah, it does show the power of journalism when it's done for good rather than evil. Seems to be the, uh, the latter more than anything these days and uh, yeah then we've got a sequel uh numbered number 10 gremlins 2 the new batch now i do have gremlins the first film on blu-ray somewhere else but unfortunately it wasn't released via the premium collection but regardless this is still a really cracking sequel not as good as the first inevitably but the madness that this film has and the insanity that it goes to and the humor is just relentless and yeah not as good in terms of story or plotting or anything like that as the first film but in terms of humor and Pure budget, it is definitely better because he spent a lot of money on this, expecting it to be a hit, but because it was, you know, so long after the first film, it just wasn't, which is a bit of a shame. And then we've got number 11, we've got the superb 1933 classic King Kong. So, uh, yeah, I really like pretty much all versions of King Kong in terms of the first film. Not a massive fan of the 70s version, but I really do like the Peter Jackson one and from 2005, I think it was, as well as the uh, Kong Skull Island. But yeah, this is where it all started. This is where all the creature features started, pretty much, uh, especially in sound. And it's where the kind of stop motion practical effects really came into their own. And uh, yeah, inspired the likes of Ray Harryhausen. And uh, yeah, if it wasn't for this, you wouldn't have had all those uh, B movies from the 50s with all their creatures and everything. So uh, yeah, sensational film. And uh, yeah. 
Still holds up to this day as far as I'm concerned in a lot of ways. Now let's move on to something else, something completely different. Number 18 from 1960, H.G. Wells, The Time Machine. So uh, yeah, I really rather like this film. It deals with a lot of themes about, you know, death and uh, your future and your fate in life and everything like that. But it's also uh, really rather uh, good in terms of its effects as well, especially for 1960. 103 minutes, so again, not particularly long. And uh, yeah, really good uh, performances all around. And uh, yeah, looks terrific even to this day, to be honest, even though it's, you know, what, 61 years old, which is pretty good. And then we've got the late, great Sean Connery in Outland, which is basically high noon, but in set in space. Basically on one of Jupiter's moons. And uh, yeah, superb, superb sci-fi western, quite frankly. S directed by the great Peter Hyams, which, who is one of my favourite directors, to be honest, and uh, who has a couple of others in this collection as well. And uh, well, at least one that I can remember. I'm not, I'm not sure if there's any more than that. But yeah, great film, really great cast, superb special effects. And uh, yeah, got some good action as well. And uh, yeah, Sean Connery is as usual a really, really good uh, presence in uh, this film. So uh, yeah, highly recommend it if you've never seen that one before. And then moving on to number twenty-five, so a big jump uh, with a uh, superb cast. And it's a World War One two film, even The Dirty Dozen. And uh, yeah, you got a great cast. You got uh, Lee Marvin, Ergus Bornine, Charles Bronson, Jim Brown, John Cavazovantis, Richard Jackal. George Kennedy, uh, Trini Lopez, uh, even Telly Savalas, and Robert Webber. And it's, yeah, great cast and a really, really good film. Again, a little bit on the long side. It's, uh, as you can see here, two hours and uh, 30 minutes. So, not a short film by any means. Uh, even has the uh, sequel on here as well, which I never realised. But, yeah. Solid film, it's alright. Not the best World War Two film from the period, as it's from 1967, and there was a lot of films from World War Two in that period. But yeah, a strong one if I've ever seen one in my life. And then we're moving on to number 26, a completely different kind of war film. It's Casualties of War, starring the great Michael J. Fox and Sean Penn. Big, big uh, change in role for Michael J. Fox, because obviously he was in Back to the Future and Teen Wolf uh, before this. And uh, yeah, this was a uh, remarkable departure, departure in for him. And uh, yeah, it's easily one of his more serious roles. And uh, yeah, really, really brutal Vietnam War film, to be honest. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of them in the 80s, but this is easily one of the better ones. And then... A superb film, one that I've recently got, number 38... The Yakuza, starring the great Robert Mitchum. A little bit older than uh, you um, would expect for a uh, action film like this. But yeah, still a great film. It's got some brutal, brutal violence in it. Because, uh, yeah, you got Samurai Sword there and a sh double barrel shotgun. And uh, trust me, that double barrel shotgun gets used in way uh, in, uh, in some spectacular ways. And it's really, really good. So, uh, yeah, it's probably a little bit too slow for some people. It's a lot more subtle in, in terms of the uh, pacing and everything. But when the action gets going, trust me, this is a glorious, glorious film. And, uh, yeah, really does deserve that 15 rating, to be honest. And then we've got number 39 from 1981. Body Heat, now this is the uh, kind of a trendsetter kind of film, because this really did set off the kind of erotic thrillers of the 80s and then the early 90s. You think back to something like Fatal Attraction or Basic Instinct, well this was out way before them, and uh, yeah, this pretty much set that trend. But it's also a neo-noir, so it's got, you know, the noir style from the 40s and 50s, but with, you know, 80s production, and it's, uh, yeah, really, really good. Not particularly long, and uh, yeah, superb performances from the two leads. Then we've got number 41, black exploitation film, Shaft. Now, this is usually the best Shaft film because the remake with Samuel L. Jackson wasn't particularly great. I couldn't even make it through 20 minutes for the uh, remake that was re out recently or the reboot or whatever it was. So, uh, yeah, this is the uh, best version of that, uh, especially since it's got the original song, uh, which was a big hit at the time. Only 100 minutes, and, uh, yeah, it's uh, easily probably one of the best black exploitation films from that period. I do like Foxy Brown and Coffee, but... Yeah, this is uh, probably the uh, more iconic of the uh, those kind of films. So, uh, yeah, highly recommend Shaft if you've not seen that. Then we go on to number 44. This is the only 3D version uh, version of a film that we have, although you can still watch it in 2D. And it's The House of Wax, starring the late, great Vincent Price, who, uh, yeah, is easily one of his more iconic roles. And it's probably the one that 
kind of kicked off his whole horror career, I'd say, because this was 1953, so this was pre The Fly and uh, Theatre of Blood and Dr. Fe- uh, uh, Dr. Phoebes and all that lot. So, uh, yeah, superb film from him. And, uh, yeah, easily one of my favourites. Also comes with the uh, original 1933 version called Mystery of the Wax Museum, which was actually one of the few uh, colour films from that period. And, uh, yeah, superb film. Only 88 minutes as well, so... Uh, yeah, if you're into a short horror films, then I highly recommend that. And then we've got another horror film, number 45, called The Haunting. Now, this has been remade several times under the, either The Haunting, the title, or other names. I think the recent one was The Turning, which was absolutely awful. The remake of this from the 90s as well was also pretty rubbish as well. So, uh, yeah, this is the best of the lot. It's black and white, so it might not be to your kind of taste if you're not into black and white films. And it is nearly two hours long. But yeah, this absolutely ratchets up the tension really nicely, and uh, yeah, superb performance from the uh, lead star uh, is uh, oh, I can't remember her name now. Uh, sorry, I can't remember her name, but she's really good in it nonetheless. And Robert Wise does a really good uh, job with the direction, atmosphere galore, and really good cinematography. Then on to number 46, probably the most well known film out of the ones that I've shown so far. Clockwork Orange, superb Stanley Kubrick effort. It's probably my favourite from him. I prefer this to The Shining, 2001 especially. Yet to see Barry Lyndon, but apparently that's really good. But yeah, I prefer this to those two that I mentioned before. And uh, yeah, second longest that we've seen so far, I think, out of this collection so far. But yeah, 18 rated, really does deserve it. But I really love the uh, everything about this pretty much. So uh, yeah, highly recommend it. Also, this unlike most films that are in this collection comes with a DVD as well as a Blu-ray and a booklet rather than a, uh, you know, oh card, so a poster, so uh, yeah, nicely done that one. And then we're moving on to one of my favourite noir films from the 40s, and it's number 47 from 1941, The Maltese Falcon, I love the red uh, cover on this, and Humphrey Bogart is absolutely astonishing in this, it's easily one of his best roles. And uh, yeah, slap bang on 100 minutes, so in and out, even though, yeah, some people do say the plot is a bit nonsensical in this, but because it's kind of on that side of things, it's just so engrossing that you're trying to uh, get your head around it, but enjoying it while you're doing that at the same time. So uh, yeah, great new uh, noir film, and uh, yeah, it's one of the originators because it's from 1941, as the genre didn't really kick off until 1944 or 1945. And another film from that uh, kind of genre, although it's more of a romantic thriller or rom- romantic World War II film even, Casablanca. Now this isn't my favourite Humphrey Bogart film, but I can definitely see why people like this so much and it is a superb film in its own right. Now you're think, probably thinking, why is it so thick? So much thicker than the other ones. Well that's because, again, like Clockwork Orange, this comes with a booklet, but unlike that film, it is so large, it has to actually, you know be out of the case and uh, yeah comes with all of the like different kind of posters and uh, yeah write-ups about it it's even got some like design work for the sets yeah it's really really interesting look at that it's so nicely done and uh, yeah great film it's a classic for every reason really so uh, yeah highly recommend trying that out if you've not seen that one yet and then on to another Humphrey Bogart film, starring the great Lauren Bacall as well, The Big Sleep. Now this is one of the few uh, f- three or four films that uh, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall starred in, because uh, there was a whole like media storm around them because they were you know deeply in love, and then they eventually did get married. And uh, yeah, Bacall was Bogart's last wife. He uh, saw out his life with her, and uh, yeah, this is one of their best uh, ones, I actually have all four of the films that they've done together, which we'll see later, but yeah, a great noir film, again, just like Casablanca was, and just like uh, uh, The Maltese Falcon, actually that is three Humphrey Bogart films in a row, so uh, yeah, highly recommend trying that out if you haven't, then on to something a bit more schlocky, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, so this is basically, you know, you, you're on the kind of King Kong kind of, uh, you know, tone of things because big monster lots of destruction and uh, yeah it might look a bit uh, schlocky and a little bit like Godzilla but this is actually the film that inspired Godzilla Toho in Japan saw this and was like yes let's make our own film and even though they didn't go with stop motion animation like in this film which is done by the great Ray Harryhausen 
they at least did obviously make a good success out of it and I'm really glad this film exists because obviously it gave us Godzilla but it's also a great film in its own right and it's really highly underrated only 80 minutes as well long and uh, yeah really worth seeing so that's number 54 from 1953 and then we're going on to another Ray Harryhausen film uh, number 55 from 1969 The Valley of Guanji so this is basically cowboys meet dinosaurs and yeah that's as epic as you think it sounds so uh, yeah again highly recommend it 95 minutes long and look at that on the back the Triceratops and I think it's a T-Rex going head to head with a cowboy with a spear at the same time and yeah that pretty much just sums up this film so uh, yeah love that film and then we're going on to another Ray Harryhausen film his last one number 56 from 1981 Clash of the Titans this is probably Ray Harryhausen what well, well Probably second most famous film after Jason and the Argonauts, which we saw in uh, one of the Indicator collections that I uh, looked at ages ago. And uh, yeah, this is another great film. A lot of effort went into this. Just you see that flying horse there? That took like a week just to f film about two seconds of it, just because of st how stop motion animation works. And uh, yeah, Ray Harry has actually had to get help on this because yeah, there were so many different effects. You've got Medusa there with her arrow and her snakes all twisting and twirling on her head that took forever to make and then you've also got a uh, giant monster there in that picture and then you've got a owl there that's a robotic owl that's there and then there you go you got the horse again the pegasus horse so yeah really really uh, good effects on this uh, but obviously stop motion effects were coming to the end of their life by that point with uh, ILM and all that lot of work Moving in with the more special kind of effects. And then we've got another Bo Bogart and Bacall, uh, Bacall uh, Noir film. Dark Passage. It's number 61 from 1947. So six years after Maltese Falcon. But they were still knocking uh, these noir films out of the park as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, these two, again, great in this film. Not particularly long, 106 minutes. And uh, yeah, absolutely sensational. Then we've got... Another Humphrey Bogart film from 1948, number 62, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. This basically is thematically rich about greed and how uh, money can corrupt people and all that lot. And uh, yeah, really good film. A little bit on the long side, 126 minutes, but it makes the most of that time with yeah great characterization and uh, yeah a lot of thematic depth. So yeah, that was number 62, so let's move on to number 63, and this is one of my all-time favourite films, and I bought it as a blind buy, so I was surprised, and it's Bad Day at Black Rock, another kind of, you know, noir thriller kind of film, and uh, yeah, it's just superb, it's really engrossing, looks great, got great cast, and uh, yeah, really well paced, and it's in and out in only just over an hour and a half, so uh, yeah, highly recommend that. I do hope you can actually get some of these films wherever you are, if you're not in the UK, because they are great. And it's yeah, really, really nice to see that these kind of films have been given the Blu-ray treatment, when in all likelihood they might well or not have done if under different circumstances. And now one of my favourite vehicle-orientated films, number 64 from 1966, Grand Prix, starring the great uh, James Garner, Eva Mary Saint, uh, Eva Montan, Tashira Mifini, and uh, yeah, also uh, Antonio Sabato. And uh, yeah, it's long, as you can see, nearly 180 minutes long, but it's absolutely superb. The races in this are amazing. They actually, for the first time in movie history, I think, fitted cameras to the cars. And uh, yeah, you can tell that they are cameras to the cars rather than, you know, you know, back projection, projection that they used to do. Uh, if you think back to the film Dot to Know, where uh, Bond is driving that small little convertible. That's how car chases used to, or car action scenes used to be filmed and uh, yet with this he went with cameras on the cars and yeah the cinematography is great the car crashes are insanely brutal and uh, yeah even though it's long it's well worth the watch because it balances the on track and off track uh, drama really nicely then on to number 67 uh, from 1965 starring Dean Martin and uh, was it Dean Martin uh, no Frank Sinatra sorry uh, Von Ryan's Express another World War 2 film and uh, yeah, got a riveting ending, and uh, yeah, it's a really, really rather nicely done. Frank Sinatra really hits it out of the park in that regard. Not quite as much as in terms of his singing, but it's definitely uh, hits it out of the park. Just realised how long this video is. God. Uh, but yeah, now we're moving on to number 72 uh, from 1967, the great uh, horror thriller, Wait Until Dark, starring Audrey Hepburn, Alan Arkin, and Richard Crenna. And uh, yeah, great film. Basically, she's blind, and uh, she's got home invaders. Uh, 
trying to get into a house and kill her. And uh, yeah, it's so effective and uh, yeah, really, really riveting. Now we're moving on to a weirder film and from 1979, number 73, Time After Time. So basically a uh, inventor with a time machine ends up having to chase after Jack the Ripper into the future. Sounds a little bit mad and not particularly like it's going to be great, but it generally is. And uh, yeah, really, really good uh, cast and a superb, um, you know, plot, quite frankly. It makes the most of its quite insane plot, to be honest. And uh, yeah, works better than it sounds. Then we've got The Hunchback of Notre Dame from 1939, number 76. I've not actually seen this one, but I've heard great things, and especially since it's got Charles Lawton and Maureen O'Hara. So, uh, yeah, I'll report back on that if I uh, get the chance to look back at any of these films that I've not seen. But this is the only one out of the collection I haven't seen yet, because I've basically got it only recently. Then we move on to Ray Harryhausen's first ever film from 1949, number 77, Mighty Joe Young. I know it kind of looks like a King Kong knockoff, but it genuinely isn't. It's got its own plot. It doesn't really go for anything that King Kong does. And does, at the end of the day, make uh, our uh, lead creature uh, a bit more uh, human in a lot of ways, which is what the uh, remake of King Kong does, which is why, in some ways, I prefer that to the original. Then we're moving on to number 19... No, number 78 from, from 1941... Directed by the great Alfred Hitchcock, starring the great Gary Cary Grant, and it is Suspicion. It's one of the older Alfred Hitchcock films I have. I think it might be the oldest, in fact. And, uh, yeah, superb film. 99 minutes, in and out. And, uh, yeah, great pot. And it's also got Sir Cedric Hardwick in it as well. Now we're moving on to number 95. We actually make a big jump from 78 to 95. Oh, no, we don't. Yeah, we do. Hang on. Yeah. I think this is uh, where we are at. No, we're not. Number 79. I do apologise. So yeah, number 79. Another great noir film. Out of the past. Once again, starring Robert Mitchum, who we just saw in The Accuser. And uh, yeah, it's also got an uh, early performance from Kirk Douglas. And uh, yeah, again, not particularly long, but a riveting film. And uh, yeah, easily one of the best noir films of its day. And uh, yeah, as you can see, superbly crafted. Once seen, never forgotten. And that is certainly the case. So uh, yeah. I highly recommend that if you've never seen it. Then we move on to number 80, starring Ida Lupino and uh, Robert Ryan in On Dangerous Ground from 1952. One of the later noirs, but still a fairly decent one. Not pati not the, my favourite by any means. I think it's a little bit too short. It's only 82 minutes, so you can't really get to grips with the plot or the characters all that well. But still, a fairly solid film. And then... Another Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall film, another, and it's pretty much similar to Casablanca, to have and to have not, or to have and have not even, and uh, yeah, Ernest Hemingway, and uh, yeah, pretty much the same kind of Casablanca kind of film, it's World War Two. it's a bit of a romance, but yeah, it, it's good in its own right, and uh, they, they really are sensational together, and obviously Lauren Bacall wasn't in Casablanca, and she certainly makes her mark in to have and have not. And then we've got another Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall one. Uh, but this also stars Edward G. Robinson, who we also saw in uh, Soylent Green. And it's Key Largo. It's number 85 from 1948. And again, more noir crime film than just film noir, but still sensational film. Set during a hurricane in a hotel. So, uh, yeah, nice one set location. And then we move on to something completely different. Which for some reason is out of order with these lot, so I do apologise. It is 82, 1976 is Marriage of a Man, starring Dustin Hoffman, Lawrence Olivier, Roy Schneider, and William Devan. William Devan, and uh, yeah, it's a really riveting uh, film about a uh, Nazi who uh, uh, has uh, some uh, natural uh, there's diamonds are basically going missing, and uh, yeah, it's. Dustin Hoffman gets uh, caught up in the middle of something that he's not really involved in. Not really going to explain too much of it because that ruined the whole thing. And then we have eight, 1984, uh, 2010, the year we make contact. The sequel to 2001. This is number 87 in the collection. And uh, yeah, I know I'll honestly prefer this to 2001. It's directed uh, by Peter Hyams, who I think knows and likes sci-fi, whereas I don't think Stanley Kubrick ever did. And he really does make the most of that genre. And, uh, yeah, also got super visuals, great score. And, uh, yeah, Roy Schneider is also in this. 
who I actually prefer to anyone in the uh, 2001. And uh, yeah, as a bit of a Roy Schneider fanboy, I'm obviously going to like him a bit more than anyone else. And then we got number 80, 94 from 1987, The Hidden. A great mix of horror, sci-fi and action. And uh, yeah, great film. I'm not going to spoil it too much because you really need to see this to believe it. But it's absolutely sensational. And uh, yeah, it's got a good cast as well. Who uh, bounce off of each other really nicely. Then we move on to number 95. Yep. Starring the great Gene Hatman. Night Moves from 1975. Nice solid thriller this is. And uh, yeah. Again, like a lot of these films, only 100 minutes long, as you can see. So, uh, yeah, highly recommend trying that out. Then we got a uh, one of the better uh, John Frankenheimer films, who is a great, uh, you know, director. We also saw him uh, direct Grand Prix earlier, and it's Seven Days of May in May, starring Burt Lancaster, Kurt Douglas, and Ava Gardner. And uh, yeah, amazing film, really. Really ratchets up the tension, and even though it's only pretty much in, you know, boring old rooms, and yet. It makes the most of those with uh, superb uh, performances and great cinematography. And the plot is absolutely nail-biting. Then number 99 from 1951. The Thing from Another World. So, uh, yeah, don't go into this for expecting it to be like The Thing from 1982. Because it really isn't. And I did that f uh, wrongly uh, first time around. But, yeah, it's definitely uh, its own thing. And, uh, yeah... If you like 50s slot B, B movie kind of films, then this is your kind of film to go for. And uh, yeah, it really did set the trend for the 50s as well, just like them did uh, in that kind of film. So uh, yeah, solid film, and James Arnes is really good as The Thing. Right, we've not got many more to go, honest. And then we've got number 100 from 1960, Village of the Damned, starring the great Barbara Shelley. And uh, yeah, great film. Really got some haunting imagery at the start, and... Uh, only really ratches up that kind of haunting imagery as it goes along. I think it's the shortest film we have in this collection at 77 minutes, so it's not particularly long, but then it's also really, really good at what it does best. And uh, yeah, and that is just basically being really weird. And then we've got another Sean Connery vehicle, also starring Audrey Hepburn and Robert Shaw. It's number 105 from 1976. It's Robin and Marion. So it basically takes the Robin Hood legend and takes it to its natural conclusion. And uh, yeah, it's really, really good. Really good action, but also a really uh, heartfelt romance as well at the heart of it. And yeah, I really like the colour that this has going for it, which is transcended into the poster that I have, but it's already up on a wall, so I can't show you. But yeah, great film, and uh, yeah, one of Sean Connery's more underrated roles, just like Outland, really. And then we've got 108 from 1981, it is Wolfen, part of the trio of films from that period, uh, from 1981 that had wolves in them. We also had The Howling, and we also had um, American Werewolf in London. I like all three, to be honest, and this is, yeah, another one of those great horror films from the 80s. And, uh, yeah, a bit on the long side if you're not into, you know, a longer kind of film, but, yeah, great effects, great direction, and, uh, yeah, really were of a good violence. Then we've got one of the lesser films from this collection, but still a really good one because of how mad it is. Starring Julie Christie, who we've uh, who is in Don't Look Now, which we have yet to show off in my uh, overall Blu-ray collection. But it is Demon Seed. Fear for her. Definitely fear her for her. Because, uh, yeah. I'm just going to show you this one picture on here, and I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah. It's okay. Alright, moving on. Uh, number 112 from 1992. Not my favourite film from this director, but it's still a rather decent one. Innocent Blood, it's directed by Joe Dante, who uh, did uh, American Werewolf in London, and uh, yeah, it's fairly uh, good, uh, but not, you know, not the best that we've had. But it's got Robert Gaia in it and Anthony P Le Pigla, or Le Pagla, however you say it. But yeah, it's a decent enough film, but yeah, I would have preferred uh, a bit more um, on the way. To be honest, I think it was John Landis that did a. Uh, John Lannis or John Dante, I can't remember which out of them that did it, to be honest. American Werewolf. Yeah, it's John Landis. So, uh, yeah, not as good as an American Werewolf in London, but still a solid film. And then we've gone to the last four now, I think. Yep, yeah. uh, number 117 from 1954, starring Cary Grant and Grace Kelly, To Catch a Thief. Another Alfred Hitchcock film, and uh, yeah, really nice and daring comedy uh, heist, uh, you know, romance kind of film. So, uh, yeah, really, really solidly done. Balances all of its kind of genres really nicely. And, uh, yeah, those two uh, leads are superb together. 
Then we've got a film that I have like less and less than I used to, but it's still a really solid film from 1987, number 118, Fatal Attraction. So you were saying before I was saying about Body Heat, how uh, that kind of set the trend for this kind of genre of film. And uh, yeah, solid film, but yeah, nowhere near as good as I used to think it was. And uh, yeah, strong violence it says, but it's not particularly strong really. It's only really at the end that there's any kind of violence at all, to be honest. And then we've got number 126 from 1972, another black exploitation film, Superfly. So yeah, it's not great in terms of production or script or acting particularly, although Ron O'Neill in the lead role is pretty good. But yeah, it's not yeah particularly great, but it is fun enough. And uh, yeah, drug misuse is the biggest problem this has with in terms of rating, but trust me, there's more to it than that. And look at that cool dude there. Ron O'Neill, plus a cool dude, that's for sure. And then finally, number 136, technically the newest film out of this collection, even though it's from 1945, and it is Murder My Sweet, another great noir film starring the great Dick Powell, Claire Trevor, and Anne Shirley. And uh, yeah, superb, superb noir film. And uh, yeah, again, not particularly long, only 95 minutes, but yeah, cinematography, direction, acting, plot, it's all great. And uh, yeah. Again, another one of those perfect films from that time. It's also got Otto Kruger in it, who was in a bunch of those uh, noir films from the time. So, uh, yeah, superb collection. Sorry this has been a bit long, but I did have a lot to go through. I've not even counted how many I have, actually, so uh, no idea. But either way, great collection of films. There's even more than that that were out there, because obviously we jumped between numbers at times. But, yeah, not all of them I actually like uh, that are available to buy, but every one I do have, I do like at least, and uh, several of them are some of my favourites of all time so uh yeah if you do live in the uk or you are able to get a, these uh, bought via another seller then i highly recommend doing so because they're really nicely packaged they are really nicely done on blu-ray and some of them do come with art cards or posters or both in some cases so uh yeah get them if you can and uh yeah highly recommend them even if you can't get them in these formats but nonetheless thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next one bye